You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. My name is Shagun Yedele, and I'm calling today from Kelowna uh, in the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. And my co-anchor is Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Yeah, hi, Shagan. Um, so nice to see you. And I'm joining you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the Point Grey Campus of UBC in Vancouver. And I am sitting here in my office together with our guests, which is unusual for us to have live guests here. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you two people that are very special in my life. So there's uh, my sister, Ursula. Hi. And my PhD student, Anthony. Hi. Why don't you introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. So my name is uh, Anthony Sirocco. I'm a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, uh, studying how to teach anatomy and physiology to engineers. Uh, and that's kind of me. Hello, I'm Ursula Krebs, and I'm coming from Germany, from in small town next to uh, Stuttgart, and I'm a graphic designer. Well, I'm thrilled to have you here. And there's a reason we have the both of you here. Um, because you experience everyday life um, very differently. So we were just talking amongst ourselves and our team about how people um, experience the visual world around them and how that influences how they live their life. So Shagan, we actually did a test with Ursula and Anthony before this recording. So we did two tests. One, the mental rotation test to see if they can um, turn three-dimensional objects in their mind and figure out which angle they're looking at these objects. And the other one is a visual vividness test. So how do you think how they did? That did? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Uh, I would have expected uh, that Ursula, being a graphics designer, should do well in actually both tests uh, in the sense that the you know, she works with graphics all the time and she's rotating them in three dimensions. And so I would think her mental rotation test would be up there. And then the visual vivid um, uh, IQ would also be quite high as well. So that's that's my guess. And for Anthony, I'm not quite sure <laughs> since he's, uh, he's, I don't know about his kind of background with graphics and working with uh, imagery, but... Um, Teaching to engineers, I would expect that to also bring about some idea. I mean, if you have to communicate with engineers who work with images and graphs and and stuff like that all the time, I'm thinking he too will have a very high mental rotation test, at least. I know, right? That's what you'd think, because I think both you and I are pretty visual creatures. Yeah. Well, let me tell you their scores. So okay. Anthony... Did pretty well on mental rotation. Well done, Anthony. He scored 16 out of 24, which is pretty good. And then on the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire or the VVIQ, you only got 16 out of 80. And that puts you like 16 is the lowest you can score on this test. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and that puts you into the aphantasia category. So basically this test means, Anthony, you cannot see things absolutely. with I, your inner eye. I, yeah, I can absolutely not see anything in my inner eye. Uh, when I close my eyes, it's just black. It is completely dark. There is no, and I have no ability to recall images or uh, rely on that in, in memory cues or anything like that. So I think that my, visual understanding the world is actually uninhibited 
by what's going on in my brain. So I think that's pretty good. Okay. Well, let's contrast this with Ursula because you scored pretty poorly on the mental rotation test. Now, this isn't like a knowledge, like this is just the way our mind works. There's no judgment here for either one of you, obviously, right? You got five out of 24 in mental rotation, but then for your uh, vividness of visual imagery, you got 69 out of 80 and that's pretty high. So tell me about how you experienced the visual world around you. Um, very colorful and um, loud and there's a lot of things going on um, in my surrounding. And uh, I can always um, associate different things with things I see. And um, yeah, I can always imagine something to the world um, that I'm looking at. But there's still even more of it than just seeing it. <laughs> just like uh, Anthony said, he, he can see everything, but you know, there's not just seeing the surrounding. There's more, there's more, there's emotion to it and stuff. So you see emotion in the world around you? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. Okay, tell us more <laughs> because this, of course, is not for everyone. Well, it's the, it's the sunlight, you know, uh, going uh, into trees or something that's emotional for me. So, yeah. That's very well, interesting. Pleasure. Yeah, Shagan, we walked through the forest here, my sister and I, and it took us like twice as long as usual because she would stop every three steps to take a picture of the light through the trees. My goodness. <laughs> that's that's unique. That that doesn't happen to everyone. And I'm really keen to hear more about that. Yeah, there was also this um, point when uh, there was this light and uh, a tree with the kind of red, uh, pinkish leaves. And they were also lying on the floor. I can just see this now. <laughs> and we were walking along the path. And it was like walking through this light up to my knees. I mean, it's just, it was really, it was, yeah, it was so good. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. It was really beautiful. So as Ursula was describing this, Anthony, what did you see in your head? I saw absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> so I can, I can, I have this sense of what it would look like. I can, I know what the, the colors would be and I can, I can intuit what the light would look like on the ground, but it just doesn't appear. It's just this conceptual idea of these colors and the way the light hits the ground and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, I find it absolutely fascinating because you mentioned that you can see it very yeah. vividly uh, going on right now. Yeah. Uh, that is, I find that, Absolutely fascinating and very cool that you could do that. It's it's kind of like a picture or a movie. Just you know, I can just call it up from my memory. Wow. Just yeah. So, what is it like when you read a book, Anthony? Uh, so, uh, reading a book uh, for me is very similar to just reading the words out loud. Uh, when I read, it is just literally saying the words inside of my head. There's no imagery associated with it. There is no uh, visual meaning to it. And even if I were to read something that has been adapted from a movie, I don't see the actors. I don't see the set. It's just me saying the words in my head. So if you read something out loud, that's what's going on in my head. That's how I experience reading. And that's why I find reading very difficult, because it is, they're just words. There's no imagery to it. That's uh, interesting uh, because we, and I know that, that there are some suggestion out there when we um, review that there's some literature about uh, students of medicine, for example, whether they are able to perform better in anatomy, for example, if they were able, if they're more visual people and uh, rather than just like text, you know, and uh, I think, you know, there's some, there's, I mean, I can correlate that with what you're saying, you know, but that's interesting, though, because you're, you're looking at teaching anatomy, anatomy to engineering students. Do, does that come into play at all, that balance between the text and the, the images? You know, how does that work for you? You know, do you are you all visual when you when you're trying to communicate uh, to engineers or do you have to incorporate some text as well? 
So when I teach, I think that one of the things that is uh, quite amazing when it comes to anatomy and one of the things that I think allows me to understand it, even though I can't visualize it, is because of the language of anatomy. It's very specific in the language. So even I just need to know the definition of the words and I can kind of figure out where things are in three dimensional space. Uh, but a lot of teaching and, and I think a lot of the education that I got when I was in engineering uh, was very abstract. It was very uh, it was lots of box diagrams and stuff like that. So what it looked like was kind of irrelevant. Like I know what a distillation column looks like, but understanding what the function of the reboiler is or the condenser is immaterial uh, to the discussion because I can just abstract it to a box, have things coming in and out, and that seems good enough. Uh, that, that, that's fascinating for me, um, Anthony, because it's, it's we do that sometimes and Claudia is kind of famous for that in terms of drawing conceptual diagrams rather than just the, 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 the actual images to say, okay, here's muscle, so here's nerve, and then here's the pathway or like a connection between say some parts of the brain is just representing them by boxes. And my, my question is, you know, it works very well for like what you've just talked about now. Like if you just, rather than um, visualizing the entire thing, just if you have a concept, concept of that in your mind, your conceptual image of that, it doesn't work for everybody though. <laughs> that's that's what I'm thinking. You know, it doesn't work for uh, some students, for example, they are more textual. Um, and so among your students or the people that you have interacted with in engineering, have you found that difference? And some people prefer more conceptual reasoning rather than the actual text or, or image. What's been that experience like for you? So, so that's a great question, because one of the things that I, I've been really struggling with when teaching engineering students is, especially anatomy, is traditionally we teach anatomy uh, almost smallest to largest. Like we can look at the organization of life. It always starts off as, you know, atom to molecule to macromolecule, et cetera. Um, but I think that at least my experience was that when I thought about it that way, it became very restrictive. And so what I've been doing is trying to flip that for the engineer. So rather doing a bottom-up approach, maybe a top-down approach. So I can kind of show them, and in the case of the organization of life, I explain to them that a organism is not just a collection of organ systems, it's a collection of different organ systems. Organs are a collection of different tissues uh, rather than tissues create organs. Because when you go from bottom to top, it's, I think it's very easy to forget that muscles aren't just muscular tissue. There's connective tissue in there. There's epithelial tissue in there. There is uh, connective tissue and nervous tissue. But when you go, muscles are comprised of these tissues, then they can go, oh, well, I can see why I need a little bit of muscle tissue. I can see why I need nervous tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue. And so I think a conceptual approach actually kind of lets them build it in their mind. Uh, and then when you present all of these things, they can go, oh, well, I saw this, I didn't see this. Uh, and I think that actually is quite helpful. That's so interesting that you say it that way. An old wisdom that was given to me by one of my mentors was, you only see what you know. And so you're building up the knowledge before introducing them to the visual world, because the visual world is quite irrelevant for your understanding, right? So, um, so that's a really interesting approach. But in your everyday life, you know, like you've got such vivid imagery inside of your head, like the scene that you painted for us from the forest. For me, it came alive right away, including with its emotional aspect, just from your words. So. Back to that question, when you're reading a book, what's happening inside of your brain as you're reading? I don't know exactly what happens inside my brain, but I know I can imagine what I read. I mean, in everything I read, I can uh, just, you know, make a story of in my mind. I can just see the characters. I see the characters. Um, they have... Uh, different appearance they uh, have different faces they have you know uh, characteristics and so 
uh, yeah, I can imagine the whole thing just as it is uh, described in the book. Yeah. Do the characters stay with you because you they're so vivid? Do they become like friends? No, that that oh. is not the point. No, no. While reading the book, maybe, but after that, yeah. you say goodbye. Yeah, of course. It's just the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. But your memory world is mostly visual then? Yes. Okay. And yours, Anthony? Uh, my memory is almost entirely auditory. Uh, when I uh, think back to a situation, I, it's a series of statements. It's a series of facts that I can kind of recall and I can articulate, say, my feelings or, or what's going on in words, but there's no... That's basically it. Um, I don't. When I think of something that makes me very happy, I'm not overwhelmed with the emotion. I just go, "Oh, that, I was very happy at that moment," and it's very fleeting. And I. How about you, Osla? Like, how do emotion and images interact in your brain? That's hard to say, but I think, um, yeah, images can. Um... Um, become emotions or pictures when I look at pictures um, they cause something they can cause something in some emotion yeah and I, I, what, if I may also, jump in a little bit and, and, and uh, uh, to Ursula that's like uh, uh, that's the question I have do you at all like what um, Claudia described earlier today when you were walking in the woods and mm -hmm. you saw this light can it get distracting though? Because I'm wondering about myself <laughs> that if there's so much uh, visuals around me, say for example, when you're, uh, and I don't know how much you drive yourself or cycle, for example, can can that visual world get a little bit distracting? Um, well, it's it's different. When I cycle, you know, you, you I don't really try to um, get everything around me. You have to focus. Because if you if you let everything uh, you know uh, get uh, at you, it's just you go you go crazy. I just um, you know cities or surroundings that are very um, um, where there are many people or so they tire me a lot because it's very yeah it's uh, exhausting. And um, but um, like in this forest, the quietness that's perfect. <laughs> also uh, for working I need quiet space so um yeah and uh this sometimes I need to to black out things just really you know just not hearing not you know just don't look at the side now just go on yeah that's that's really stunning uh Claudia what do you think <laughs> Well, it's interesting because, of course, I've lived with my sister, you know, most of my, well, all of my childhood, obviously. But and then um, it's uh, it, we always had a very different way of experiencing the world. And you have a bit of a crossover between the auditory world and the visual world. So you were born deaf in one ear. So you only hear in one ear. And uh, and yet the auditory world is very important and it crosses over into your visual world. Can you describe what that's like? Well, um, sometimes uh, it, it can happen that I, uh, when I hear a sound, uh, then it's a, it, it, it has a color and that's, uh, yeah, that's ex extremely um, annoying sometimes. <laughs> it depends on the situation, you know, uh, a brake squeaking, can be uh, very pink. Uh, the the ventilation, the air air condition in Claudia's uh, lab is uh, like a big gray hood over my head. It's just you know makes me foggy. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, sometimes um, sounds are colored. And uh, yeah, but it, it's uh, um, not, it is very seldom at, that I see the color at the same time, really with my eyes. That happens too, but that's very seldom. Usually it's, um, 
there's a sound and I know the sound is blue or pink or whatever. Interesting. So when you when you're working as in graphics, yeah, uh, do you ever take inspiration from sounds to influence your design? So if there's something, if the sound makes you feel a certain way, do you use similar colors if you want to elicit that same emotion? Well, I I don't do with my work with graphic design. I do that more with my artwork. So um, that yeah, but uh, that's very cool. <laughs> So, Anthony, you're also a musician. And yes. so how does your auditory world cross over into the visual world? I'm going to not doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but 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 music is, is very important. Um, so I can I can switch my mood almost immediately by just changing whatever I'm listening to. And if I want to hyper focus on something, I can just have something play on repeat because it just kind of becomes this nice massage to my brain that lets me uh think uh a little bit more abstractly um i kind of view the, the i like i've never experienced the visual stuff that you folks see but i i it reminds me uh, reminds me a lot of uh the pinball wizard song by uh, the who he's uh deaf and blind but he's this pinball wizard because he's able to use intuition and smell to play pinball uh, which I find kind of going to uh, your point, Shagan, where the visual seeing might be so distracting. Uh, so, yeah, I just, whenever I listen to music, I don't have to worry about anything interrupting the music. It's just there and I can experience it in all the weird and wonderful ways that my brain does. Can you imagine music in your brain? Like if I, if you're thinking about the pinball wizard, do you hear it? I can hear okay. the song. Yes, yeah. I can. I could hear the song, uh, and I could hear the. I could hear the riff. I could hear the the rhythm. Uh, it's not as. It's not like it's a concert playing or like if it was something in my ears. But I can hear the different tones and and stuff like that. And. Uh, but when I say wizard, what do you see? <laughs> Nothing. I, what do you see when I say wizard? Oh, I can see a, uh, I can see an old man wearing a hat and having a beard and, uh, you know, like uh, this Gandalf guy and yeah, yeah. Lord of the Rings and yeah, uh, he's he's here. He's there. He's from... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he has blue eyes. He has blue, blue eyes. eyes. Interesting. <laughs> That's so... interesting. Go ahead, Anthony. Oh, so when, like, how many details can you pick? So you mentioned, like, the eye color of, yeah. of wizard. So does he have, like, a mole? Does he have the draping? He has the bushy eyebrows and a long beard, which is, like, uh, whitish gray, more white than gray. And uh, his hair is long, pretty long. He should comb it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And, uh, yeah, he's wearing a cape and uh what color is the cape oh it's like a uh, yeah bluish green yeah mine was purple in my oh, yeah. okay no yeah i'm just wondering claudia just if i can bring this for our students uh in a second because if we have students and i don't know that i think um, if you look at the probability i'm sure along the lines that since we've been teaching we probably have had students with these, uh, um, with these sensory modalities as well. And I'm wondering whether it's possible to leverage that for learning, you know, whether it contributes to how they learn and whether it's, it serves us as an advantage or not. It, um, and I don't know whether Ursula can have, you, maybe whether you have an opinion about that, say a student who can see colors or who hears the word, I don't know, um, uh, a doctor brevis, you know, or a word in anatomy, uh, say the uh, cranial cavity, and that brings up some colors or, or, or sounds or other senses that they have, and whether that will help their learning or maybe be a disadvantage to their learning. Do you have an opinion about that? Well, I think I, um, it depends on how often um, you you have this, um, you know, you, you hear the colors and stuff like that. And 
Yeah, but for me, it's uh, sometimes uh, distracting because uh, sometimes it's like, um water has uh different colors sometimes when i hear it when i'm under the shower then it is associated with normally um, what is like blue or uh, bluish but sometimes purple i can hear it's it's uh it's it's purple you know and uh or or a green it depends on how it how it splutters and you know the way the water is running or yeah so um that's <laughs> you should see Anthony's face right now. He's just like oh, it's so fascinating. And I'm thinking, you don't even see the color purple when I say purple, but when I say purple rain, you hear prints in your head. I I do. I see <laughs> that the first thing that would come to my head is yes. Uh and check it to your question. I think the challenge as an instructor kind to leverage these things is they they are very personal. Uh mm -hmm. and I think in order to leverage them, it's more giving the students the ability to interject that personality um, and not kind of prescribing it. So like, for example, um, because I don't really, well, I don't at all see things, uh, the physical limitations of, of what I'm thinking about kind of becomes irrelevant. And I can leverage that when I'm trying to really conceptualize and break through something that I'm trying to understand. So. Uh, I don't know if you heard about the new uh, organelle that was uh, discovered. Uh, anyway, um, and so when I when I studied cell biology, all the images that the instructor gave me are the same images. And I saw the video, the inner life of the cell. And I, for a long time, had this conceptual idea that that's what a cell looked like. And it wasn't until I heard that the cell is actually a lot more gloopy and fluid than those images uh, suggest that all of a sudden I went, oh, I can now manipulate or I don't have to worry about the cell looking a very particular way anymore. I can remove that piece of information. And now I have so many more things to kind of conceptualize and work with. But when you say you don't have to worry about the cell looking that way, you don't actually see anything no but like i i know where the nucleus i have that image i've seen it so many times i know where the nucleus is i know where the the rough er is but when it's in the image saying it has to be in this space it becomes restrictive in what i want to think about and so when i just remove that idea it allows me to be a little bit more creative it allows me to oh, wow. take that concept out of it so you're not bound by the visual world whereas you are you just yeah, wow yeah so, yeah. so i cannot uh, i cannot uh, imagine you know um being creative in a way like that just um putting everything in order and knowing it's there i mean i that that wouldn't be creative for me at all but I'm, and i think it is uh, it's a, just a different way of creativity but i um that's something I wouldn't be able to do because I am my um, imagination is so much uh, more in, in focus. And, and, yeah. and, and your form of creativity, I would never, I, can, I can't even conceptualize how you would, I, I would just be overwhelmed with all of these things. I would find almost an inability to move past that. There was constantly this visual information being streamed to my consciousness. So that's very fascinating. Okay. Well, sometimes, as I already said, is it can be exhausting, but uh, I I don't want to miss it. It, it gives me so much. <laughs> yeah, in life. Yeah. What a beautiful way to kind of um, almost wrap that thought up, right? Like you wouldn't want to have it any other way. And I think that's true for both of you, right? Mm -hmm. Like it enriches both of your lives in your individual ways. So. When we were making fun of you, Anthony, for scoring low, well, it's actually you've totally leveraged it to your advantage by, you know, finding your creativity and your approaches in a completely different way from Ursula, whose um, creative approaches are visual. It's really, really fascinating. Absolutely. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful balance <laughs> almost between um, auditory and visual 
and how in, in your individual ways you um, contribute to the beauty that we see in this world in, in your creativity and the work that you do. So that's that's excellent. Well, it's a good point to begin to wrap up uh, this episode. And we have a question that we ask all our guests. And uh, so I'm going to start with you, Anthony, and I will maybe help. That would allow Ursula to think a little bit about uh, the answer that she might like to give. And that is, what is your favorite body part, Anthony? Do you have a favorite organ or part of the body? Uh, because this is body banter, after all. We like to ask you, uh, yeah. what, what part of the body is your favorite? I, I My favorite part of the body is thalamus. I have this conception of what thalamus can do in this. And from an engineering standpoint, it's described as this filter. And there are so many different types of filters. There are physical filters. There are sound filters. There are filters that base are based on size and charge and all of these things. And so I just find the thalamus absolutely fascinating. Wow, that's uh, music to <laughs> music to Claudia's ears because it's part of the brain. I love it, and I just did a lecture this morning about the thalamus. So thank you for that. Oh, How about you, Oslo? Uh, maybe my hands because I do so many things with my hands, and uh, you know all this art uh, stuff, uh, everything that I imagine or yeah visualize. I you know, when I want to um, make it to be seen by others, I, I will need my hands for that. So maybe that would be my favorite organ. <laughs> and going back to you, Anthony, do you have any least favorite body part? Uh, yes. Any, any uh, structure whose name doesn't make any sense. So like nucleus ambiguous. Uh, it's the part of the brain that doesn't look like anything. Why name it that way? I, I absolutely hate it. <laughs> that's that's yes, so yes. funny. I don't. But like nucleus retroambiguous also infuriates me. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Ursula? Oh, I don't really think I have a part of myself that I don't really like. <laughs> So yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. leave it at that. Perfect. That's perfect. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You have given us insight into two vastly different ways of living your lives through your sensory organs, your sensory experience of the world. Um, thank you for that. I this was absolutely fascinating. It's been a blast. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And that's a wrap on this episode of Body Banter. See you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>